We first met Emeritus Professor Stephen Hill, AM, uh, who was Regional Director for Asia Pacific and Ambassador for UNESCO in the first part of the subject when we were looking at the structure and history of the United Nations. Today we're talking to Stephen about um, negotiations and diplomacy, in particular negotiating in the context of a crisis. Um, on the 8th of January 1996, members of the Free Papua Movement, known by its acronym in Indonesian, the OPM, took 26 people hostage in Mapenduma. The western half of the island of New Guinea was absorbed into the state of Indonesia in 1969, but there's been an ongoing independence movement since 1963 and at times low-level guerrilla war. The West Papuans in the group were released, but the remaining 11 hostages, four Britons, five Indonesians and two Dutch, were held for over four months. Stephen, can you explain a bit more about the background to the crisis and yes, OPM? Of course. The crisis really started when the Netherlands decolonised that part of uh, west, uh, the western side of, of Papua New Guinea, or New Guinea, uh, back in 1963. Uh, as a decolonisation exercise, it was required to be a plebiscite by the people where they could choose what they wished to do with their freedom. And that was held in 1969. Unfortunately, by this time, Indonesia had moved in in a big way. They brought in the administrative staff, they brought in military, they brought in uh, support for industrial and, and logging uh, work which was going on, which was enormous wealth, I might add. Um, and they, uh, by 1969, the plebiscite was actually completely contrived. They interviewed, I think, oh, the plebiscite had 1,100 people or thereabouts from different parts of, uh, of West Papua. Um, but they were told very clearly and trained in Indonesian of the sort of sentences they had to say, otherwise they would be, in fact, as one of the people who was there told them, they'd be shot if they said the wrong thing. So it was not exactly a, a free and open election. The United Nations accepted it. They did not do enough, quite frankly, uh, due diligence on this issue. The result was, and although the Papuans had said right from the start, from 1963, we want to set our own agenda, we don't want people to come and tell us what to do, we want to choose our life. We have had this life for thousands of years. Why should someone come in and tell us what to do? But they were never allowed to do this. In fact, what happened with Indonesian control was that it was backed up by very strong military suppression over quite a long period of time. Quite a lot of West Papuan people were killed. Uh, in the jungles, but usually no one knew because it was so, so remote. So the OPM got to a point where they really became very impatient with what was going on there because nothing was happening. They did take hostages previously, uh, but always Indonesians, not, not overseas hostages. Mm -hmm. In this case, they had the idea of what they called capturing white noses, in other words, people from overseas, uh, on the basis that they would get more attention internationally, mm -hmm. uh, with international attention. Uh, it meant they felt their cause would be justified further and also, most importantly, at least the leaders believed this would be a path for actually bargaining for independence with both the United Nations and other communities, which unfortunately it could not have been in terms of normal international mm. politics and so on. So it was a terrible tension between a demand which could not be met uh, and a people that were desperately repressed and seeking to find a way out of the situation. Now what then happened is that um, on that date which you mentioned, the 8th of, of January, uh, 200 tribes people invaded the village of Mopanduma, which is where they captured the, the hostages. Prior to that, a group had come in from Cambridge University, four students from Cambridge University, who quite frankly had no idea what, whatsoever about how to, how to work in a community such as the West Papuans. We they actually, we talked with them before they went, as did WWF, the World Wildlife Fund for Nature, uh, pointing out in particular they should not take Javanese people with them. Because in the, in the jungles of West Papua, the Javanese were associated with the military, the military of the people who killed them, so Javanese were always at risk, no matter what happened. Mm -hmm. Secondly, they didn't pay attention to the, to the normal law and culture of the people. So, for example, um, they would um, uh, walk across people's fields without asking permission. They took from the land. But samples, only samples, but the point is they took. And as one of the rebel leaders said, they come like the miners. They come here to take, not to give us anything. And they came in to the Mopindu in two planes with one ton of equipment. Okay? The people have nothing but a string bag on their head, or alternatively a penis sheath, which the men wear, 
uh, as both ceremonial as well as work occasions, uh, and nothing, nothing else basically at all. So this was a tremendous contrast. They, very, they didn't directly invite attack, but they certainly exposed themselves very badly to this. Uh, then our people were people from the United Nations with, again, people we were working in very close association with the World Life, World Life Fund for Nature, uh, because the, the area where the hostages were, which is called the Lorentz National Park, uh, is an extraordinary national park. It goes quite literally from tropical glaciers, which is only two, I think, in the world, wow. all the way through the land to the ocean with every conceivable possible uh, a landscape and ecology in between. Mm -hmm. And it's an extraordinary place which we were helping the government to put, to put forward as a World Heritage Site, which did finally happen. The job of the woman from my office, Marta, uh, was to monitor Lawrence National Park. And the person, one of the people she travelled with, Mark, uh, was her partner. And he worked both for me as well as for WWF. What happened was that they unfortunately took the trek for eight days into the town of Mopenduma, and they were there, unfortunately, on the day when, they were, when the other people were attacked. And as the other people said, look, we, we understand that you are here. And we'd, we'd been working with them for quite some time, mm -hmm. the, the West Papuan people, um, and in the jungles, in the places where, these, where the, the capture was, was happening. Um, and one of, the, and the, one of the hostage leaders said, uh, we understand that you are here to help us and so on, but this is a gift from Jesus Christ. We will take you. And they took them as hostages. Many of the West Papuans were released fairly quickly, as a matter of fact, so it did leave it with the core group of um, some uh, Javanese who were there uh, accompanying the Cambridge group from the Biological Sciences Club in Jakarta. Uh, the, the Cambridge group of four and our own group, which was three people, there was another person from WWF who walked in with them. They were then taken off into the jungle and a tremendous Saga followed from there for 128 days before we were able to get them released. Two people were murdered at the time they were released, but I can come to that story shortly. Thank you. Oh, that must have been a very tense situation, Stephen. Can you explain a bit more to us about the roles of the various parties and how you undertook the negotiations with both the OPM and with the Indonesian government as well? Mm. Um, it was very difficult. It was, it was uh, very scary uh, for me as well because I had people that were on the line and I had a responsibility to somehow get them out without them being killed. I mean, that's not normally in the job specifications that, that most people in their normal or, or daily work. Negotiating was honestly like dealing with swirling mists and finding a way through the mists which were coming from all different sides because there were many things happening at once. The first thing was that people were in the jungle and communication was very hard. At one stage, for example, uh, we had developed in the very early stage what we call sheds, which were schedules where they communicate with the rebels at a certain time every day. Um, and then suddenly they stopped. And we thought, ah, they're playing hardball, they're stopping talking to us. They, they, they went, come. And it turned out they were totally wrong. In fact, the man who had the radio had been told by a priest that the military might attack. So he headed off into the jungle with the radio in the opposite direction to the rebels. So we, the rebels were lost, as far as we are concerned. It took some time before we finally developed contact again. Now, the initial negotiations were done at the village level of Mopenduma uh, with two people from the church. The church has a strong and very valued influence, in fact, uh, both Catholic and Protestant missionaries in, in, in West Papua. Um, but unfortunately, that broke down for a number of reasons, including the fact that the military started to distrust the key priest who actually came from Mopenduma, who worked in Mopenduma, who they felt was now trying to make himself a big man and sort of get all the credit for the negotiation and telling lies about the military, which I think actually was happening. The military was the other side of this and they scared basically us very considerably because the, the first response of the military from the very top, the General uh, Tanjung in, in uh, Jakarta through to the regional commander was one of a tough, hard-line, let's attack policy. We will release the hostages and be great heroic uh, military men to do this. And we knew that if that happened, there's a very high chance our people would be killed. So we had to put enormous pressure on the military. And we did this. I mean, I did this personally as well as so did others, the, uh, particularly the, the embassies from which the countries, uh, the people came from, from overseas. That was England, the uh, UK, I should say, uh, Germany and uh, the Netherlands. And those three countries were involved as well at the deputy ambassador level in, in the negotiations. Um, but what we needed to do was to 
try and stop the military, or to, to put enough pressure on the, on, the, on, the, on the government and the military to actually prevent this happening. Now, them attacking, basically. Fortunately, uh, they appointed a man called Probovo Subianto, who happened to be the son-in-law of the president, which helped his status uh, somewhat considerably, who was trained in the United States and basically was a professional military man who ran the, the, the special forces of, of Indonesia. And he, he did take a, a, very, a very good line of um, trying to hold back his own military, of allowing the negotiations to go forward and seeking to foster those negotiations. But still, there was always a tension because inside the military, other forces, for example, were trying to white ant his position because they wanted to attack. And so he was always this tension, either within the military itself. And our concern particularly was that they hold the military back more than it was anything else. So we had a negotiating team, which was uh, consisted of uh, the people who's from each of the embassies. Uh, the military, of course, was involved in, in the team. Mm -hmm. um, but so too was myself as representing the United Nations in, in, the, in the responsibility. Uh, and in particular, the International Red Cross. The reason was that we, as a country or as the United Nations, were not able to negotiate directly with the rebels because it's a political situation which is regarded as, as the issue of the internal state. And therefore you can't interfere, as it were, from outside. And the International Red Cross were accepted by both the rebels and ourselves as being a mediator in this case. And, and they played a very important role. Now, the first thing they had to do was to seek to establish um, uh, some contact with the rebels. And so what they did, because again, we didn't know where they were, was to drop people in key villages down a corridor where we thought they probably were going, mm -hmm. and, and leave messages to say, you know, contact us, this is what we're after, and, and so on. And after a while, that actually worked. We did finally establish contact mm -hmm. with them. Uh, and then the next stage of negotiation started. Now, meantime, uh, we were bedeviled ourselves by another uh, part of the negotiation. I believe very early, for example, that if we put pressure on the rebels through uh, international uh, support from the highest leaders in the world to say hostages are a bad thing, really, this is not good, you, you'll lose your credibility if we keep them. And that was fine. And one night, one whole night, literally from dusk till dawn, with the head of the United Nations Development Program, the two of us sat down with a fax machine and many cups of coffee. And we organized by morning to get a letter from the, uh, the, the Secretary General of the United Nations, the Director General of UNESCO, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and the Pope. And we figured that the uh, letters from the Pope and the Archbishop would be, the, would be our best shot, because the people had, for example, the, the leader, the guy who had actually made this choice of, of, of capturing the rebels, uh, had studied as a seminarian, in fact, with the bishop who was coming from in from Womana, the, 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 the closest town. So we thought this is going to work. It didn't. And the reason is, for example, when uh, the bishop actually came in to read the letter personally to, to this guy, Kuali, and the, he thought about it very carefully, and then at the end of, end of the, the, the reading, he said, he doesn't talk at all about us, about the West Papua, and he just simply presents this this requirement from the outside world without any attention to us, it is worthless to us, okay? Mm. And the other letter from the Archbishop of Canterbury was treated in a very interesting way by the deputy uh, head of the, of the group, uh, who said, I have here in this hand this letter, and in this hand I have these hostages. This is so much lighter that he threw it away. Again, the same message about culture, which was important. And it was then critical what happened when we finally established real contact with the rebels when uh, a man called Frank Meyer from the International Red Cross finally was taken to see the rebels directly in, in personal contact. He was taken from his helicopter 100 metres, uh, no, about 300 metres, to a cliff uh, with about a 100 metre drop and perched on the edge, surrounded by 200 tribesmen dressed in spears, uh, sorry, dressed in paint and bones and spears and bows and arrows and about four or five guns, old, old guns actually. Um, but pretty terrifying and intended to be that way. And the guy who came to see him was number three in the hierarchy, a man called Titus, uh, Spears, I'm sorry. And he looked at, at uh, Frank for probably about two minutes and then said, what do you want me to wear? A T-shirt or a penis sheath, which is the natural, or kotika, which is the, the, the dress of, of uh, men in, in the tribal society. And Frank thought for a minute, he said, that is your choice. Whether you wish to, wear a bit, to uh, 
work as a or be a traditional person and wear traditional clothes, or Western clothes is your choice, not mine. But I have three T-shirts I can give you if you are cold. Okay. Now those were the two key cultural values. One was accepting that the people had the voice, and the second was the giving of gifts as opposed to taking. So two or three, uh, two times later, when he finally got to the the, the, the head of the group that actually captured the rebel, that captured the hostages, a guy called uh, Daniel. Um, he, uh, the first thing that uh, Daniel said to him was, what did you come here to take, the hostages? And uh, Frank said, no, I didn't come to take the hostages, I came to give you these. And he had gifts and food and things which would help the hostages and so on. And when you choose, you will give me the hostages. Okay. Again, the same pattern of culture. And each time he got a further step upwards in the negotiations. It took a long time, backwards and forwards, and fights between the... I mean, even some of the other tribes, for example, uh, were absolutely against taking of hostages. They said, this is not our way. Uh, and so some of the tribes, they couldn't go to some areas, because the other tribes people would have literally waged war upon them if they'd been there. In fact, when they first attacked, there was one man in Mopenduma, I think his name was Philippus, and he stood up against 200 rebels and he said, you cannot take these rebels, these people, it is against our way, I will declare a personal war on you, you know, and I mean, that's pretty brave, brave. To, to stand up by yourself with 200 um, rebels and wow. tell them you're going to create war. Anyway, he didn't actually make war on them and they did take the hostages, but he was quite supportive in other ways a bit later as well. Eventually, we got to the point of, of potentially getting released. It was quite a complicated process like this. Um, but, um, Stephen, despite getting to that point, in the end, the um, Indonesian special forces did come in yes, and they they did. Were, re hostages were released through yes. force. Why did the negotiations break down and uh, well, what happened uh, there? In fact, the negotiations didn't break down. We had organised with the, the rebel movement, with all acceptances along the line, to have a handover ceremony with a feast, which was going to be conducted close to where the, where, where the hostages were actually being kept. Um, the International Red Cross, on request, brought in people from representative villages that the AP wanted to have there, including the father of the leader of the group. Mm -hmm. uh, and the villages were there to support the handover of the hostages. Um, we had the, the rebels wanted to have it as a, a big media occasion. So they said, we want a big camera, because big camera reflected international things for them. And because I used to look after media freedom in Indonesia for the United Nations, was my job to find a very large camera. Now, that's really hard these days, because they're all about this small, okay? Anyway, we finally found one, we sent it down, and the thing was being filmed, and the program started, and everything was going well, and then the leader, Kelly Kwale, came into the, to the meeting. He had a, a hat on made from possum skin, uh, and he spoke in Indonesian, uh, not, in, not in the local dialect. And that meant that most of the people who were there, the, the partners, couldn't understand him. And the, the, the hostages, they most of them could understand some Indonesian, of course, um, but they weren't listening because they thought, oh, we're about to be free, you know. And they suddenly realised that what, what Kwalek had said is, I will not release the rebels until West Park was declared a free and independent state. And that just broke everything apart. And all the negotiations, there was nowhere else to go in negotiation. So the International Red Cross had no choice but to pull out because they were told to go, and the hostages were taken off into the jungle by the rebels. The leader, this guy Kelly Kwalek, he immediately took off in the jungle in the opposite direction. And he left the people with the hostages that were there. All the gardens were occupied by the military, all had been destroyed to, say that, to, to, to stop any food supply being available. The, um, so for five days they didn't eat. They were being taken through the jungle, they couldn't eat. Uh, Marta, I forgot to mention, uh, my staff member was pregnant. She, decided, she discovered this just before they went into the jungle. And part of the reason for the trip was to work out their relationship and then they get captured and taken off by the rebel movement, which they didn't really expect. She even got malaria because they took them from the highland where there was no malaria down into the lowlands they didn't expect to go. So we had a lot of main problems with all of that. But when they were taken off into the jungle, the military was now uh, released. They could attack. There was a rumour, not a rumour, a fact, I should say, that a helicopter which was white, which appeared to be imitating the Red Cross, came in and eight people in the village were killed by military people. We know that. Um, but meanwhile, the military took a while to try and find the hostages. They were even using drone air air aircraft as well. Uh, we had, they kept us saying they didn't, but it was actually something which we, we could source from Singapore. We knew what it was. And one of, the, one of the hostages talked about it as being like a toy plane that just went over the top. 
And they're using this with infrared sensors to try and identify uh, where the people were in the jungle. Okay. Finally, um, they did come into confrontation with the military, but it was an amateur unit, not the, S, not the special forces, and they were scared in the jungle. They literally was standing, sta uh, sitting behind a rock, um, not and they were not prepared to come out, where one of the young women, about 100 metres away, was staggering down the river, having just injured her ankle quite seriously. They wouldn't come out to help her. Okay. That was their own forces? That was, yeah, that, well this was the, yeah, the, the, the force which was just a regional force and not, yeah. not, the, not the special force. Right. And what happened in the middle of all this was that um, at this stage two of the Indonesian hostages, uh, the Javanese, were, were murdered by the, by the rebel movement. But we believe, uh, not by people who travelled with them, they were people we understand and we think, and I had a photograph of one of these people, who had come in from outside to the, to the ceremony and they were the, the people that killed these, these two people. Um, afterwards, uh, then finally that night, the what I'd call more amateur group of the military looked after them in the jungle, but very badly. They they couldn't build tents properly. They, the battery had run out on their communication devices, and they were scared to go to the jungle to bring the bodies out and so on. Next day, the SA, the special forces came, and they were very professional. And finally, finally we got them, we got them out. Um, but it was a terrifying period. This last period, as you mm -hmm. can well imagine. Uh, and they went through extraordinary trauma before they were finally, finally released. Mm -hmm. And it really was because, um, ultimately, ultimately because I think the leader had become what in the culture would be called a big man. Mm -hmm. And he was now a big man on an international stage, and I suspect he didn't want to put it down, quite frankly. Uh, but he, he betrayed, in many ways, his own people in, in doing this. But it, it was just very sad, because the OPM did have a genuine cause, but this certainly was not the way to to actually make it happen. But it did start quite a lot of uh, attention from the international uh, community and press to the issues of West Park where that did happen. And secondly, it opened up opportunities for us as a development assistant agency to work much more closely with the people as well. So on that, I know that you continued your involvement in West Papua and um, particularly there was a drought not long after the hostage crisis and there was some, some interesting responses there. I wondered if you'd tell us a little bit more about that. The sort of like a progression of things. The first thing we did was to respond to the crisis mm -hmm. because in Papua society, pigs are really important. They're the basis for giving in bride prices, they're for exchange. And at ceremonies, men, or the big men, give the pigs uh, as a feast. Mm -hmm. And their status comes from giving, not from possessing. Okay? Uh, but all the pigs have been killed because the military and the people and the rebels and everybody had killed them. And they had no pigs left. And the result of this was that they were in a society where their basic social capital was missing. So I said, right, we're, along with the head of WWF, we will replace the pigs of Mop and Doom. I then flew 108 pigs to the people of Mop and Doom. And on an exercise, I finally called in the uh, uh, United Nations, uh, Operasi Turupang Babi, which means the flying pigs operation, which I thought was uh, quite interesting. But uh, when it was presented to the world in the general conference, nobody asked me any questions, which I thought was even more interesting. Um, but this was important because they could see that this was something which was valuing their own needs and their own culture. Okay? And it was shortly after that that several of the tribal people came to our people uh, in West Papua and said, we haven't been out of this jungle before. Uh, I mean, they had been to the small town of Wamana. They knew what the town was like, but it was pretty much a frontier town. You could only get there by air or by a walk over, you know, sort of a very long time. So it was pretty isolated. Mm -hmm. And they said, we want to see what the world is like out there. And I said, all right, I'll bring, bring you to Jakarta. And I brought 25 chiefs to Jakarta. Um, they, we, we provided most of the funding, but they, they paid for some of it themselves by selling things like produce and uh, uh, things that they had that they could sell to help support it themselves. They really, really wanted to come. Mm -hmm. And so it became a really major media role as it came up through the, as they came up through the archipelago, through the different islands, uh, because the... Um, the press really picked it up. You know, here is jungle people coming to the city for the first time. And there's some very interesting things that happened, I must admit. They were very wise people, I found. They genuinely were. But I said, for example, when they came to Jakarta, it would be good to have a press conference. Uh, this is such a big occasion. They said, no problem. In our traditional society, we, we talk with each other, we orate, we discuss, we, we argue. We can do a press conference. So they all came to the, the United Nations building where I had this being held, and they said, we would like to dress formally for this, to honour the occasion. And I said, fine, I've had my suit and tie. Then they took all their clothes off. 
and put on the beads and you know the, the bones and all the other bits and pieces. They were going to paint, and that was how the how we had our press conference, which was unusual compared to the other ones which I had run at other times. And then one of the people, is the, the secretary of Suharo, as a matter of fact, took them out to a restaurant, the first restaurant they'd ever been to, let alone being in a city, let alone anything else. It was a teppanyaki Japanese restaurant, okay, with the people throwing eggs at each other and sort of throwing things in the air, and they're literally transfixed at this extraordinary example of what city culture was like. So I'd like to think what happened when they went home, I suspect, but I, I, this is not true, of course, but I, I suspect that, I had suspected that now the pig ceremonies, they're flying there, actually, and all this, I don't think so, but anyway. But they had these, but they really learned something from this and they wanted to keep going. And they all met President Suharo, who personally came out to meet every one of them. Okay? Wow. And it got to that level of, uh, now, that again signified a, a much closer attention to what was happening in the mm -hmm. province. Mm -hmm. And then we found, it was only a year or so later, that the, when the drought hit, it was really causing terrible troubles for a lot of people. And sometimes the problem was that water was there, but they couldn't get at it. It was either down a deep ravine or it was in some place that was that needed to build some capacity to bring out the to bring the water up to them. So we followed that program and we got um, we basically brought in pumps and pipes and other things and depending on different uh, requirements and the amount of lift that was required. Sometimes there were diesel pumps and sometimes there were hand pumps and sometimes they but we also brought in uh, by this time, we'd also created uh, two culture centres because we wanted to recapture the traditional crafts, which were actually disappearing. Like even making stone axes was starting to disappear as a craft. And so we brought this group together and they, they made sculptures and other things. But we used that centre to also train the people from the villages in, in building a storage capacity for the water, building barrels. So we brought people down from Jakarta to help them build the, bar build the, uh, the, the barrels themselves so they could also store the water. And the final thing, which was the, the problem we had, really problem we had, was that once we, we had, uh, I was doing this in cooperation with the government of Denmark, who we were very, very good, um, but they had the responsibility to provide the big pumps to come into the country. The design criterion, of course, was they had to be able to be carried by a man for eight days through the jungle. Okay? And unfortunately, they forgot to notice this. It was in sort of the slip, slip their attention. And I had pumps which literally could be lifted by a forklift truck certainly not by an individual, because they had welded all the bits together, so we had to pull all those apart. Meantime, we'd, we'd, the man, uh, the NGO, which was in Wamana, who we'd hired to, uh, to contract the labourers and uh, the people who were going to do the carriers, I mean, take, them into the, take the stuff into the jungle. He had a hundred uh, of these guys sitting in the culture yard, of, uh, the yard of the culture institute which we'd set up, mm -hmm. every day eating food, taking away his profits, and finally he said, oh, I'm going to take these into the jungle. didn't tell us but set them off into the jungle with the pipes and the cement. So I found myself with not a single one person left and all the pumps sitting on the ground in Wamana, which wasn't helpful. So we, we put a lot of energy, you know, we actually put sending in the hydrology people and sending down the cultural people that were working with them, and we finally fixed the problem. But one of the key lessons from that was really important is, even though it was not our responsibility, by putting real energy into making it happen, it built enormous trust with the government that was supporting us. And from after that, anything we did, basically, we got support from that government with very minimal uh, opposition because they trusted the fact we would work hard to make things happen. And that's important, I think, in any development assistance program. Fantastic. Stephen, thank you so much for your time today. And uh, if you're interested in learning more about Stephen's experiences, he has actually written a book on it called Medeca, Freedom, Jungle Hostages and Flying Pigs. Thank you. Thank you.